our planet was born in fire, then grew with disaster. Yet even then, the elements of life were present. Water was soon present on the surface. When calm, it would provide a sheltered cradle for the first life on Earth. While the planet was born in fire, it was baptized by ice. For millions of years, it was covered by a frozen shroud. Yet it seems that life not only persevered, but prospered. Microbes evolved into a myriad creatures. And one was the first to leave the oceans forever and tread on land. Only a few million years ago, creatures that we most resemble began to walk the Earth. Our own lives seem so fragile, yet science tells us otherwise. It tells us that we are but a part of the greatest journey ever made. It tells us that all life is linked through time to those simple cells which drifted once in the first oceans of a miracle planet. Four and a half billion years ago, the Earth was a very different world. Under layers of thick, gaseous clouds was a planet still hot from its birth, with an atmosphere both dense and crushing. Bathed in filtered red light were oceans far deeper than those of today. And there was one other great difference. The early planet was probably only a tenth of the size that it is today. But it was to grow. And that chance and violent growth would prove crucial to life's history and to what we are today. The early solar system was far more crowded than now. Where today the four inner planets orbit, Four and a half billion years ago were scores of smaller planets orbiting the sun. Orbits of some were drawn by gravitational force towards each other. Encounters of awesome magnitude were unavoidable. The force and heat of those collisions melted the rock, but gravity would hold the two together and then weld them into one. With each collision, the planet would grow larger. We believe that of the four innermost planets, Mercury was formed by only one or two such collisions, while Venus, almost the size of Earth, was formed by eight. Mars may have escaped any collision. But Earth, grew largest, perhaps from as many as 10 impacts. And the last impact, four and a half billion years ago, would have a profound effect upon our world. The giant body crashed into the center of the planet and gave Earth its iron core. The lighter debris was cast off into space and then drawn into orbit around the enlarged planet. For some millions of years, the Earth had rings like the planet Saturn. Smaller collisions continued, and from that debris was born our moon. It was chance and chance alone which made our planet larger than any of the other planets close to the sun. 
And somehow, somewhere in this chaos, life began. But quite where is open to conjecture and debate. First life uh, probably emerged on the Earth by 4.4 billion years ago, uh, fairly soon after the Earth formed. My guess would be that this life ca came from Mars. Uh, Mars was open for habitation before the Earth is. It's a much safer uh, place to live if you're a microbe early in the solar system. If life evolved on Mars, uh, rocks would get knocked off and this would seed the Earth. Could life have formed on Mars? We know because of the evidence of erosion that water once flowed freely on the surface, that Mars did indeed have an atmosphere, that conditions were suitable to sustain early primitive life. But Mars is a small planet with weak gravity. Over time, the atmosphere escaped into space. Most of the water vanished too, either into space or held deep in the ground as permafrost. We know, too, that Earth has been hit by rocks that originated from Mars. Some scientists are positive that primitive microbial life could withstand that journey. But the Earth, because of its size, had enough gravity to keep its oceans. Over the ages, continents have shifted their positions, wind and rain shaping and reshaping the surface. Ice has scraped its way across the face of the land, and the seas have risen and fallen again and again over time. Here, in Greenland, are some of the oldest exposed rocks ever to have been found. And one belt of rock, four kilometers, almost two miles long, may take us back as far as we can go in the long history of this planet's existence. Dr. Minnick Rosing of the Geological Museum of Copenhagen has visited Greenland many times in his research for evidence of Earth's early history. And close to the margin of the glaciers, at a place called Isua, he has found one of the oldest rock beds on the face of the planet. Here is the geological evidence that this was once an ancient seabed. This rock was once molten lava, which flowed 3.8 billion years ago. Its shape and structure identify it as pillow lava, which can only form under water. Pillow lavas show you that there was oceans on there, or that there was water on the surface of Earth 3.8 billion years ago. And we know on the ocean floor today that this is the habitat of many life forms. And this could be a, a um, place where life emerged on Earth in, in such environments. And this is a very rare thing. We have been walking now for a couple of hours through rocks where you can't see anything. And then suddenly there's like one square meter where you can look 3.8 billion years back in time and see what happened on Earth at that time. So there are a few very rare glimpses where you can look way, way, way back to the most distant parts of Earth's history. But there is another rock, unremarkable to look at, which hints that life might also have been present. Only a meter or so square, no larger than a beach towel. It too is 3.8 billion years old. This rock was also part of an ancient seabed, but it is the black band which fascinates Minnick Rosing. This is a layer of fossilized carbon which he believes might be the earliest evidence of life. Under the microscope, tiny black grains can be seen. These possibly are grains of carbon, the building blocks of life. If so, there may have been tiny microorganisms drifting in the water that were alive, taking in nutrients, reproducing, and then dying, and dropping slowly to the ocean floor. When the carbon was deposited those billions of years ago, the thin straight lines on the rock show it was undisturbed, proof that this was the bottom of a deep ocean, and the thickness indicates that already life was plentiful. This is not the emergence of life. It, it cannot be because 
we have all this black color and that means that there was very efficient life that could make a lot of carbon and this life must have been very sophisticated. So life must have been had had a long prehistory and one could speculate that probably life formed on Earth maybe 4.3 billion years ago when the oceans formed as, and, and the conditions for life were present, life could have emerged at that time and uh, definitely by 3.8 billion years ago life had reached the level of sophistication that allowed it to live in the water and produce a lot of carbon so it was highly advanced life at this time. For these microorganisms, the prerogative was simply to survive. But the challenges to life were daunting. The early solar system was still a violent place. Asteroids come hurtling out of space, attracted by the greater size of the planet. And on the face of the Earth today, we can see the scars of recent collisions. This crater in Arizona is well known. It's the Barringer meteorite crater and was gouged from the surface only 50,000 years ago. The impact crater is huge, 1.2 kilometers across, just under a mile. And it was thought that the size of the meteor must have been the same. So perhaps buried in the ground was a fortune in iron and nickel. In the early 1900s, the Standard Iron Company was formed by Daniel Barringer to dig out the perceived wealth. When my grandfather came up this ridge and looked at it, he imagined that the object that made this hole was at least as big as the bottom diameter of the crater, which is, again, more than half a kilometer. He thought this would be millions and millions of tons of nickel iron, and it would be commercially immensely valuable that he could make millions of dollars here. The mining venture lasted 27 years, and in today's money cost around $10 million. But nothing of any value was found. But while the mining venture gained nothing except a useless shaft, Ready? There, it goes. there was to be a winner after all. It was science. In 1928, a paper was published which concluded that the mass of the meteor was far smaller than the size of the crater. Further mining was called off. And shortly after, Daniel Barringer died of a heart attack. I think I could have easily made the same mistake because it's such a large hole. And it's intuitively, it seems like it would have had to be a huge rock that would have made it. In fact, the meteorite which caused this crater was no larger than the perimeter fence around the mine shaft. Science learned it was the force that was as critical as the size of the object. But about four billion years ago, the Earth was hit by a massive space intruder, 10,000 times larger and a trillion times heavier than the rock which grazed the Earth in Arizona. At Stanford University in the United States, Dr. Kevin Zanley of NASA and Dr. Norman Sleep from the university are studying the impacts of meteorites on Earth. But first, they must look at the moon. You like to look at it pretty early, so you get nice shadows. It's also pretty nice. Start with On the Earth, the evidence of the very earliest asteroid strikes have been weathered away by erosion or lost with the tectonic movements of the Earth's crust. Let's see if we can orient it the same way. Whoa, where is everything? But the moon has been stable since its creation over four billion years ago, so craters are there from that long distant past. By looking at these craters, they hope to estimate the number of times the early Earth might have been hit. It is far larger, its gravitational attraction far stronger, and they estimate that our planet was hit 25 times more often. 